All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, this special free seminar with Dr. Michael Baker, Teaching Casualty Care in Ukraine and Why Defending Their Democracy Matters. Uh, I'm Shana. I'm the OLLI Program Coordinator, um, and I'm going to be giving a brief introduction um, before we dive right into uh, this seminar today. So, Dr. Michael Baker is a retired general, vascular and trauma surgeon, Commonwealth Club, World Affairs Board of Trustees member and Osher Lifelong Learning faculty member at UC Berkeley, Dominican University, California State University East Bay and California State University Channel Islands. And some of you may already be familiar with him. He also served 30 years in the uniform of his country, retiring from the US Navy with the rank of Rear Admiral. He has published over 80 peer-reviewed articles on a wide range of subjects from wounds and trauma to medical intelligence and building the hospital ship of the future. He has had three tours teaching casualty care techniques in Ukraine during the Russian invasion and frequently speaks and writes about this conflict and defending democracy. And we are lucky to hear from him today. Um, so for those of you, I see a lot of familiar names in here. Hello and welcome. Um, for those of you who are not OLLI members and you're interested in learning more, I'm going to put um, a link in the chat to um, where you can enter your information and one of our membership team volunteers will contact you to learn more about becoming an OLLI member. Uh, and as far as any questions, um, if you have questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat and then Dr. Baker will address them at the end of his seminar. Lastly, Daniel, our OLLI director, and I would both love to wish you happy holidays. Thank you and enjoy the seminar. Great. Thank you, Shana, for that gracious introduction. And thank you all for joining me this afternoon. And a special shout out to a couple of my friends and family that I see have dialed in here long distance. Um, again, questions, love questions. I'll stay as long as you want. And even after, you're welcome to email through Shana and I can answer your questions on email. Uh, I want to take you to Ukraine. Uh, both so that you become more familiar with the history and geography and to understand why I was there and what I did there. And then I want to teach you a little bit about where it's going and we can discuss current events, which are, of course, extremely worrisome at this point. Um, you know, why did a general, some of you have heard this, we're going to go over a little ground we've done before. Why is a retired general surgeon traveling to Ukraine during the war? Well, Shana mentioned my second parallel career. I think it had a lot to do with me being invited. Um, I had decided to serve my country after surgery training and fellowship. Uh, I wanted to find something. I looked at various opportunities, um, such as the Peace Corps, and I found out that the Navy was short of general surgeons. Uh, so I volunteered to join the Navy. This is me getting sworn in. You've heard me joke this before, but my kids always laugh and say, this is before you had kids because you still have hair. Uh, this is when I got my first promotion to lieutenant commander. Uh, in my Navy dress blue uniform, two and a half stripes on the sleeve of Lieutenant Commander, and pretty much an unadorned jacket. When I finished, uh, at the end of my career, I had picked up a little color, the broad stripe of a rear admiral on my sleeve, a uh, gold warfare pin above my ribbons, which was very unusual for a doctor in those days, and uh, a few uh, campaign ribbons and personal awards. So it was a really interesting opportunity to be involved in things other than what I did every day, because a lot of what I did in the military was tangential to medicine and not always directly in, involved with it. Europe's been at peace for 75 years. How did this happen? Whoever, I never dreamed anything like this would happen. Mark Twain said God created war so that Americans would learn geography. And boy, we're all a lot better at it right now, aren't we? This year, we've got a couple of wars and we're getting better. Um, Putin had several bogus reasons for attacking Ukraine, despite all these years of peace and the fact that Ukrainians don't want to have anything to do with Russia. He said Ukraine has always been part of Russia and that Ukrainians are actually Russians. Uh, neither one of these is true. I'm going to touch on them briefly. I'm going to use some outside experts. Sometimes I put a video clip in here of someone I know or a friend, as, as you'll meet a couple of my friends in this talk. Uh, but neither of these is true. If you look at the map, depending on where you are in history, so I picked out 1619 when today's Ukraine was part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, uh, which included Latvia, Lithuania, Poland. Uh, it was a big country, and it was all one part of that 
Commonwealth in 1619. And this lasted for a while. But if you go further back in history, and this is what really gets interesting, there was a point of time where Eastern Ukraine was under the sway of the Ottoman Empire. And if you go even a little bit before that, um, Snake Island, which we're going to hear about today in this talk, you may have heard about it in, in the news, uh, was actually where Achilles was sent to heal from his wound. Isn't that interesting? If you read the mythology, Snake Island is mentioned in Greek mythology. So the Greeks were here, the Ottomans were here. Um, you know, here's Ukraine today, but it was part of a lot of other places. So is it really part of Russia? Well, 1991, when it got out of the Soviet Union, this is Ukraine in, in total. Um, but I'm going to highlight some areas. So the yellow area here in the middle, um, you know, was what Ukraine was designated by the czars up till 1917. But in 1922, over here at three o'clock on your screen, Lenin uh, added the Donbass and Luhansk and some of these other regions and called it Ukraine. And Khrushchev in 1954 down here added Crimea to Ukraine. And Stalin twice added uh, areas uh, in the western part to Ukraine in 1939 and 1945, during which time he was busy starving several million Ukrainians in what was called the Holodomor, which is absolutely kind of predates the Holocaust. But, you know, it was a, an incredibly bad thing. Um, but this is today's Ukraine. It's patched together from all these areas. Borders shifted often. Um, it's been part of many countries. Many empires changed a lot depending on the war. Um, Ukrainians are not Russians. I want you to meet historian Yuval Harari, who explains this very succinctly. The most crucial thing to know is that Ukrainians are not Russians <clears throat> and that Ukraine is an ancient independent nation. Ukraine has a history of more than a thousand years. Kyiv was a major metropolis and cultural center when Moscow was not even a village. Uh, for centuries, Kyiv was looking westwards and was a part of a union with Lithuania and Poland. His belief was, at least, that he just needs to uh, uh, invade. Zelensky will flee, uh, the government will collapse, the army would lay down its arms, and the Ukrainian people would welcome uh, the Russian liberators throwing flowers on them. As we'll see, those babushkas were throwing Molotov cocktails, not flowers. The Ukrainians are a very real nation. They are fiercely independent. They don't want to be part of Russia. They will fight like hell. And boy, did they. So what did we see? Um, before we get to the actual war itself, Putin's got several other reasons that he said he had to take Ukraine back into Russia, one of which was that NATO is getting too close and that someday Ukraine might join NATO. But if you look at the map of NATO, and this is uh, a map that shows kind of what's changed over the years, the original countries um, in NATO as before 1997, Germany, France, England, Norway, Spain, Portugal, Italy, uh, you know, we're an alliance, a self-defense alliance. And after the fall of the Soviet Union, these countries that are labeled 1 through 14 that had been under Soviet control after World War II, um, they all rushed to join NATO. It was the first thing they wanted to do was protect us from Russian hegemony. Um, so Estonia, Czechoslovakia, Croatia, Montenegro, Poland, Romania, they want to be in NATO. They don't want anything to do with the Russians. So Ukraine, I put a gold star up there. Uh, there's the Baltic countries. They share a common border with Russia. I don't know how much closer NATO can get that sharing a common border. Uh, Turkey's very close down here. But most interestingly, for those of you who might, there's this little gray spot between three and four here. Uh, some of you may remember the book Hunt for Red October, Sean Connery's submarine sails from Kaliningrad. This is Kaliningrad. It is a Russian naval base with atomic subs and atomic weapons right in the middle of NATO between Lithuania and Poland. So, you know, this whole thing of NATO is getting too close really has no meaning, particularly when it's a self-defense organization that's not aggressive. Uh, but we know how the uh, aggressive the Russians are and having shown their hand, previously neutral Finland and Sweden rushed to join NATO. They want to be in that self-defense alliance after all these years of being uh, essentially neutral, uh, Sweden, you know, which is the heart of neutrality, has 
put in an application for NATO. Finland uh, has been preparing to fight Russians again for 80 years because they fought them in the late 30s, early 40s. Um, and fought them to a standstill, but they know they're coming back. So Finland also joined NATO. You know, they know the bear is hungry, the bear is coming, and they fear the Russian bear. Uh, and we see it historically over and over. And then we have this issue of Kaliningrad. I, I don't understand why it's tolerated and still there, but it's going to be a friction point. So why did Russia really invade Ukraine? There's a couple of interesting reasons when you look at it. Part of it is to erase the humiliation of the Soviet collapse. In the 2007 G7 conference, Putin said that the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. Wow, forgot about World War I, millions of casualties, World War II, millions of casualties, the Great Depression, people starving, uh, 1918 to 22, flu epidemic, millions died. But he thought the collapse of the Soviet Union was the biggest calamity of that century, which is, of course, nonsense. Part of it, as we'll talk about, is he needs to take control of a resource-rich land. It's good for his economy. He wants to restore the glory of the Russian Empire. And people have said he sees himself kind of as a reincarnation of Peter the Great, bringing back the Soviet Empire. But there's one more thing. You know, I mentioned the rich in natural resources. If you look at Ukraine, it's got heavy reserves of uranium and titanium and manganese, um, iron ore, a lot of it, uh, and also has a big part of the world's neon supply. So taking this from Ukraine could really affect Las Vegas and other places. I'm just teasing a little bit, but I didn't even know that till I started looking at the map and reading up on it. And, you know, when I go to an academic discussion, you know, we show the map to where all this stuff is, and you can see that it's a very, very resource-rich country. But even more important than that, it's an incredible agricultural resource that up until the war was able to meet the food needs of 600 million people, which is about 12% of the global food production. I mean, that's astronomically important for a lot of people. Uh, the map prior to the war, it shows that exports were going to China, India, Egypt, Turkey, North Africa. Uh, feeding a lot of people, and particularly in the poverty-stricken areas of North Africa, the food from Ukraine, which was corn and sunflower oil and wheat and soybeans, was feeding a lot of people. It was crucial. And most of it left by ship through the Black Sea, as we'll talk about. But most important, and one of the things that Putin cannot tolerate, a free and democratic country next door, because it makes him look bad. There's no question about it. So let's jump to the invasion. February 2024 it had no justification and violated all international norms. And I am still to this day stunned that the United Nations does nothing. Um, he launches a special military operation, which I think of as it's really a war, stupid. Uh, it's, he killed a lot of people. It's a real war. When Vladimir Putin invaded a peaceful Ukraine, his brutal shock troops committed hideous war crimes against women, children, and the elderly. He bombed cities, towns, and villages. And now, you know, they can't win. I guess we can just blow up infrastructure, punish the civilians. So they invade from multiple vectors. If you look at the war map, Institute of War and other places, uh, you know, they pretty much came from every direction, thinking they were going to sweep right through Kiev and Kharkiv and Dnipro and all these places. Uh, didn't work out that way. Uh, despite the massive bombardment of Ukrainian cities and towns, um, where they damage schools and hospitals, shopping centers and railroad stations. You know, none of these are on my uh, list of important military targets. Power plants, maybe you could say, have some importance with the electric grid, uh, but they did a lot of damage. So one of the tricks was, you know, you, you bomb the shopping center like you see here, and you wait 15 or 20 minutes till the first responders pull up. You can see the red truck there. And then you bomb them again so you can wipe out the first responders. So that was a Russian trick. Um, here's a, an area blown up in the middle of, of the city. Again, not a military target. Uh, here's death and destruction at the train station with the tra station master. I mean, this, this is pretty crazy. So you're going to see some graphic slides today, but war is not pretty. It also triggers a massive refugee crisis and a humanitarian crisis. It's bad. I'm going to show you a little clip about this. On February 24th, Ukrainian families woke up to their country under siege. Missile strikes and military attacks destroyed homes, schools, and businesses, putting countless lives at risk. 
In the days that followed, millions of people were forced to flee their homes in search of safety, setting off the largest refugee emergency in Europe since World War II. In the first six weeks of the conflict alone, a quarter of Ukraine's population were forced to flee their homes, finding safety in other regions of Ukraine or crossing borders into neighboring countries. Interesting. A quarter of their population had to flee either internally or externally as refugees. Staggering number. Um, so what did Putin accomplish so far with all this? Well, over 3,100 schools have been heavily damaged, 1,300 destroyed, according to the UN uh, UNICEF, so they're good at counting damage, but not stopping the war. Um, 140,000 Ukrainian buildings have been destroyed by bombs and rockets. That's a lot of damage, as we'll see. Over 1,000 hospitals damaged, 128, according to the World Health Organization, have been completely destroyed. So think about your neighborhood, and they take out one of the hospitals in the city you live in. If you're like where I live, uh, that would put an enormous strain on the remaining hospitals, uh, not to mention uh, the fact that all surrounding homes, 1.5 million homes have been destroyed, a lot of people displaced. And this is, you know, a photo that you may remember from early in the war, a woman being evacuated from a maternity hospital, another great military target. Uh, she is pregnant. She and the baby died later that day, unfortunately. Um, this is a little video clip about an apartment building that was targeted, and I want you to take a look at the yellow furniture in the, the video you're going to see that predates the rocket. And the rocket shows this residential building, Dnipro, a lot of casualties, ultimately 49 died. Um, not much of a military target, is it? So here's the birthday party. Notice the yellow cabinets and furniture celebrating mom, dad, two kids. Um, mom takes the kids to the park. Uh, dad stays home to straighten up, and what happens? He gets hit by a missile. Um, dad's killed. Home is destroyed. Family is displaced. Um, military target, right? I, I'm just kind of astonished by this. So the family's now refugees. Um, you know, let's pray for their future. It's going to be tough. The family disruptions are profound for a lot of reasons, not because of the millions of homes and businesses lost and the thousands of Ukrainians killed and injured, but a lot of parents are serving on the front. And you got 13 or 14 million people who are displaced internally or externally. When you travel around Ukraine, what do you get to see? Well, you see that the grave diggers are working overtime um, everywhere you go, big towns, little towns, uh, cities, uh, a lot of people. Um, and I, and I kind of always feel my heart breaks when I see this photo because this guy is my age peer. And here he is in front of his house with a shovel. And he's going to rebuild his life when he should be enjoying his retirement. Uh, Got to give him credit for fortitude. Um, but, you know, the Ukrainians fought back. They don't want to be part of Russia. They're fighting for their homes. They're fighting for their children's future. And, you know, they're out in the middle of the night when the Russians were invading filling up wine bottles and other things with uh, stuff so they can make Molotov cocktails and stop the armored attacks. Um, and they stand fast and fight. And so I'm going to give you one or two examples of the heroism just because I, I'm astonished by the response in some uh, aspects, one of which I mentioned Snake Island, where Achilles went to recover. Uh, 18 guys were defending Snake Island. It was a little outpost and radio station when the battle cruiser Moskva told them they must surrender. Uh, it became, their response became an iconic um, poster and t-shirt, uh, which is one of my favorites. They're signaling here in the universal language. But I just happened to find a radio transmission in Russia that I got someone else to translate for. Needless to say, I won't repeat that, but, you know, 18 guys looking down the big guns of a battle cruiser, and you know what? They're going to fight to the death. Um, why? Fighting for your home is different than being the invader who fights to kill and loot. Remember, there are plenty of pictures of Russian soldiers who were looting widescreen televisions and refrigerators and putting them on their trucks to take back to Russia because they didn't have that stuff. Napoleon stated, the moral is, the phys is to the physical as three is to one. I think it might even be more. Uh, the Ukrainians were fighting for their homes. And so I'm going to give you uh, an exemplar just to sh kind of show you somebody that just kind of knocks my socks off when I think of the story. He's a 15 year old Ukrainian drone pilot.
Last summer, Andre Pokorasa saved up enough money to buy a drone. 15-year-old practiced flying every day at his home near Kyiv. But in February, Pokorasa's town suddenly found itself on Russia's warpath. Russian tanks were spotted heading their way. Ukraine's military didn't know the exact location, so they began looking for a drone pilot. More than a thousand civilians answered the call to help, including the youngest volunteer, Pokorasa. The Russians were only a couple of kilometers away, but the military needed their exact coordinates. Pokorasa was the only experienced drone pilot in town. Before long, he spotted an armored column of Russian vehicles. His father sent the images and coordinates to the military, and the Russian column was destroyed. Pokorasa's town was saved. Uh, no, He's credited with 100 targets killed. 15-year-old um, boy. Pretty impressive, I, I, you know. And what did he say? This is my home. So the Ukrainians fight back. The Ukrainian forces fight back. The Russian troops uh, in the spring counteroffensive are pushed back out of away from Kiev and Kharkiv and some of these other places. You know, if you look at the Russian vectors, all these red arrows coming in uh, on this particular map, uh, you're going to see that when you go from February, a uh, couple of months, you're going to start to see a bunch of blue arrows and the Russians are going to get pushed out of northern areas, uh, uh, particularly north and northern east of, of Ukraine and also down near Kherson. Um, you know, they made really good progress. This, this last offensive uh, got bogged down, didn't go as well. We'll talk about that. Um, but when all this was happening, you know, this was all news to me and I was trying to figure out who, who and where and what was going on. And one of my friends and shipmates from the Navy is a guy named Malcolm Nance. He joined the International Legion the first week of the war. He was on TV a few times as a commentator and then went and put on a uniform. Um, the International Legion in Ukraine is made up of volunteers from over 50 countries, unlike the Russians. Uh, who take them out of the prisons and give them guns. These guys get background checks and psych evals. I don't know how deep, but, you know, they get an eval. So he came back for a week in August. He'd been there for a couple of months, but he was promoting his book. He was giving a talk at the Commonwealth Club. And, I, I you know, I had to go see my friend, right? So uh, I went down there to get a book and and uh, ha go over his book with him. And, uh, you know, of course, we had to get a selfie. And then we went out. And we talked about what's going on in Ukraine for a couple of hours. And, you know, I really got a lot of insightful stuff from this guy. And plus, he's a very charming companion to go out and, and just talk about everything that's going on in the world. And he goes back to Ukraine, you know, a short book tour, straight back to the war. Um, I don't hear anything from him for a bit, but I want you to hear him give a little bit about his talk. Uh, an author, a commentator, Navy intelligence guy. Um he has lots of and I said this on MSNBC. I said, these guys are going to fight. I can tell by the look in this man's eye. Right. He is ready to kick Russian ass. And I said this on one of the MSNBC shows about three or four days before the invasion. And they were like, well, you know, the invasion will be quick. They'll right. lose rather fast. And I said, hey, let me tell you something. They I were talking about the Ukrainians losing. Right. They the said Ukrainians the Ukrainians, are, he would be in there within two weeks, it would all be over. Right. It's Kiev yeah. would be taken in right. 72 hours. And, and I you made still some... believe that, that the sure. Ukrainians are going to win. Sure. So, you know, I mean, I'm a member of the International Legion. I, you know, I, I am with the forces that are fighting the Russians on the front line on the Eastern Front. Russia, definitively, without any question, is going to lose this war. So he goes back. Things are quiet. I don't think much about it. And then a week later in August, I was asked to travel to Ukraine to teach ATLS. And I'll give you a little background on ATLS. It's sponsored by the International Medical Corps. It's called Advanced Trauma Life Support and the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. I had to look these guys up. I'd never heard of either one. Uh, I've heard of Harvard, of course. Uh, they're in the news a lot today. Um, but they, you know, the course ATLS Advanced Trauma Life Support teaches medical providers to manage acute injuries. It's very well suited for combat. I've been teaching it for decades. I teach it for the US military. Um, and it's, it's an excellent course. And part of the reason is 
it's sponsored and accredited by the American College of Surgeons. You know, those of us who become instructors and course directors, you know, we go through the training and pass the tests and everything. And the American College of Surgeons is like our guild. You know, it's like the bar. Um, it's the course was introduced in 1980. And it came about because an orthopedic surgeon crashed his airplane and his family, he felt, was handled very poorly and kind of disjointedly. Um, he says, we need to have a standard protocol for injured patients. So introduced in 1980, really caught on in about 1985 when I became an instructor. It's been taught to over a million doctors and other medical professionals. And up until the war, it was in 80 countries. I've taught it in Egypt and Thailand and Korea and all kinds of places, both to U.S. and foreign military medical providers. Now it's 81 countries, as you'll see. ATLS teaches the students to focus on that first opportunity to assess and stabilize a casualty. Uh, gives you kind of a foundation. We're going to do this this way, the same way every time. We teach you a common language, so we use the same terminology, a standard approach, for care, what used to be called care during the golden hour, because, you know, here in the U.S., a lot of what we were doing when we first started teaching this was car accidents, right? Uh, you know, now, unfortunately, we're dealing with a lot of penetrating wounds from weapons, both in the U.S. and, of course, in the military sector. You know, if you step on a mine and your leg is blown off, uh, you might have a golden five minutes. So, you know, we teach people to recognize and stabilize. And so I decided I would go. And being the kind of Navy officer I am, you know, I didn't mention much to my kids where I was going. I just said I was going to Europe to teach, and they didn't think much about it. I caught a plane from San Francisco to Warsaw. It's a 12-hour flight, but we got a delay, so it was 18 hours. So I was pretty whipped when I got to Warsaw. Um, and, you know, you get across the, the globe. It's always interesting. I like to teach my kids that when you go from San Francisco to the other side and to Europe, you know, it's interesting that it's a curved line is the fastest way to get to Warsaw. Uh, I always crack up, you know. Um, when I got to Warsaw, I had to change planes. I went to the desk and I said, what gate do I go to for this city? And oh, by the way, how do you pronounce it? And uh, lady looks at me and smiles. And she says, no, it's pronounced Zhezhov, just like it's spelled. And I kind of looked at Zhezhov and I said, well, okay. Um, I figured out, you know, I, I could pronounce it even if I couldn't spell it. And we went from Warsaw, where the star is, down to Zhezhov, just like it's spelled. And the next morning, we took a van to the border. That was about 90 minutes to get to the border. And then you dismount. So why do you dismount at the border? Because there's 20 miles of trucks waiting to enter Ukraine uh, with weapons and ammunition and fuel and stuff that they need. And you don't want to wait three days. So you walk across the border, which is why they told us to bring carry-ons, which was good advice. Um, we got a van on the other side, and then we got to go to Warsaw. So we 60 minutes to get through immigration. We meet a van on the other side. We're here um, in Zhezhov. We go to Kiev. It's about an eight-hour trip on side roads. It looks like it'd be fairly fast, straight shot. But the fact of the matter is you don't want to be embedded in, in those ammunition convoys or next to the fuel trucks because uh, you're in a war. That's a bad place to be with the targets. So you go on side roads. And it took us a little while to get there. But you know, when I got there, Kiev just was, it felt safe. It was clearly a country at war, no question. We went through checkpoints and fighting posts and armed guards, air raid sirens, bomb shelters everywhere. Uh, I'll show you a little bit of this to give you a flavor. So driving down the road, you go through these, uh, past these areas where you can see there's concrete blocks and sandbags on each side of the road. And they alternate so that you have to slow down. It's called a serpentine to us, those of us uh, in the military. And if you're on guard duty in the serpentine, it makes you slow down really far. So here we're approaching it. I'm shooting from real quick because they didn't want us shooting pictures. And I don't want my phone taken away. When you get to the other side, the greeters might decide they want to inspect your truck or your van and see who you are. Or look at your papers or see what you're carrying. Uh, the greeters were, were very polite. And... Uh, you know, when we got to Warsaw, I mean, excuse me, when we got to Kiev, we had a security uh, briefing so that we all knew where we could go, where we couldn't go, where the bomb shelter and the hotel was, all that. And uh, they loaded a new app on our phone, which is very interesting. You may have seen something about that in the New York Times today. But we got a new app right away, which is, I, I want everybody to, to hear because it's kind of interesting. Old school air raid alerts are sent to the streets by an official pushing a button. Now that same official also pushes a second button that triggers the app, which often alerts people faster than the sirens. Attention, air raid alert. Proceed to the nearest shelter. 
Don't be careless. Your overconfidence is your weakness. Anybody recognize that voice? You'll hear it in a second again. Attention. The air alert is over. May the force be with you. So Mark Hamill paid for this app to be developed and installed on, on the Ukrainian phones. Um, I mentioned it in the news today because uh, apparently there was a Russian hack attack uh, on this app. And so basically to prevent Ukrainians from knowing it was time to go to the bomb shelter, right? So anyway, we did go out and about a little bit till we set up to teach the course and did some sightseeing. Uh, everywhere we went, there were these blast barricades so that you could take shelter in a heartbeat if you had to. Uh, we saw numerous displays of uh, captured and, and destroyed Russian equipment. And this is actually uh, near the area where Zelensky and President Biden met right after the war started when he visited the cathedral up on the hill. And, and this is the area, that same area where they've sandbagged their monument uh, because they know that if the Russians can't steal it and take it back home, they'd just as soon blow it up because that's just their style. Um, but it was interesting to walk around. People were just living their lives uh, with an occasional run to the bomb shelter. Um, I thought I was done with that first trip. You know, it was interesting when I got home. Um, you know, my kids weren't too happy figuring out where I had been in a war zone. Uh, and I told them, actually, I felt pretty comfortable. And then I got invited to go back again in October to teach in Odessa. Uh, and in Ismail in March 2023 for a third time. And that was kind of interesting. Both of those are on the Black Sea. Uh, I, I learned a little more geography, a little more history. Um, and you find, you know, I always love when I go to a Rotary Club to show them that you go to Ismail, which is on the Black Sea, where the Danube enters into the Black Sea, which is something I didn't know before. There's a Rotary Club, um, one of my favorite organizations because they do so much good. But when you go there, so if you look at the map of Ukraine and some of the big cities, this is the area we for those two talks. And down here where the blue star is going to, you can see Odessa just above it. That's Ismail. It's on, both are on the Black Sea. Uh, interestingly enough, when you look at the map of where the combat is, the uh, orange and red is Russian occupied. The blue are areas where there's fighting. And, and you can see that Odessa and Ismail are kind of not too far from where the Russians and the fighting is going on. So, you know, we did have some windows rattled and some things, but again, nothing nothing terrible, terrible, um, but you knew your or. So on all three talks, every set of uh, ATLS lectures, we would teach Monday and Tuesday, have a Wednesday off, and then have another group of students Thursday and Friday, and we'd get it all done in two days. And every time we did, there's always three parts to these lectures, the training, and I always had interpreters that were very good. So we'd start with a didactic lecture. Then if necessary, we'd give a demonstration. And then we'd do hands-on skill stations. Very, all three are very important. Uh, those of you who are educators know this very well. Uh, you wanna embed it. Um, and so here I am with my interpreter on this particular slide, new subject, interpreters on my right shoulder. Uh, every night they made sure the slides were correctly translated because Google Translate sometimes doesn't do it exactly say what you want to say. We teach a language. And the protocol language is very straightforward. A is airway. B is breathing. C is circulation. D is disability. E is exposure. I mean, it sounds simple. It's actually, there's a lot to understand and know. Uh, but if we teach people to do it the same way every time, chances are they won't leave anything out, which in trauma care is very important. And if you can get all this done without being interrupted or having to be distracted to take care of something critical, uh, you can do a secondary survey and, and, and look for other problems that are less immediately life-threatening. Uh, but the big three life-threatening ones are airway, breathing, circulation, D, disability, like neurologic injury. So, um, you know, if you see something wrong, you have to do a life-saving intervention. That's what we teach. If there's a problem with the airway, do an airway maneuver, open the, do a jaw thrust, chin lift, like all of you learned in first aid. If the airway is occluded, maybe blood or teeth in the airway, you've got to intubate or do a surgical airway. So we teach them how to secure the airway. Um, make sure people are breathing. They need supplemental oxygen. You need to put in a chest tube because they've been injured in the chest and have a collapsed lung. We call it a pneumothorax. Uh, does the circulation need support? Do they need a tourniquet, pressure dressing, uh, start an IV, those kinds of things. So, um, And if you do an intervention, go back and start the ABCs again because something might have changed while you were putting that tourniquet on. So uh, 
we just teach kind of this rote way of doing it. Don't forget it. Make sure you can do it. Uh, and then we do skill stations with mannequins. So after we did the didactic lectures, we did some kind of demonstration like this, and then we do the skill station. So in this skill station, you're seeing a young pediatrician learning how to do a tracheostomy. He's going to do a surgical airway. The blue thing in his hand is a scalpel. He's working on a mannequin. Uh, it's a great way to teach these skills. And, uh, you know, when they found out and realized we had Wednesday and Saturdays off, uh, they decided we should probably teach Stop the Bleed, which is another ACS course. So it was developed uh, as a course that's four hours long to teach people how to recognize uh, life-threatening bleeding and to intervene successfully uh, with pressure dressings, tourniquets, and wound packing. It's also taught by the American College of Surgeons and promoted by them. And the instructors are all certified, and we were all certified in that as well. So it worked out very well. We taught civilians. We taught all kinds of people. Um, I'm going to give you a little clip from this, uh, two parts to it. You're going to kind of laugh a little bit. When placing the tourniquet, you should first look to see there's a windless rod, a windless clip. Placing it on yourself, you would first tighten the Velcro to the point where the patient may have some discomfort, but most importantly, all bleeding is stopped. Then you would turn the windless rod and fasten it into the windless clip like this. So you get the idea, but then we wanted people to learn how to do the hands-on. Right. He's the winner. He gets the gift card. No, teasing. But, you know, so we taught a lot of people. These these were non-physicians. Uh, so what did we achieve? Well, I'm told that altogether in our groups, uh, 20 trips, 20 teams going to Ukraine to teach ATLS. We taught 400 doctors and other medical professionals. And I say that because sometimes um, senior trauma nurses and or dentists or others uh, will learn this. Physicians assistants in the U.S., uh, we'll learn this as well. They completed ATLS. Um, 1,300 or more people completed Stop the Bleed. Uh, in our last tour, you know, when you do nation building, the most important thing was during our first groups, we picked out guys that we thought had instructor potential and we trained them as instructors. And so the last couple of courses, they did the training. And in the 20th course, uh, I actually was certifying these guys to be future instructors. It was great. They didn't need us anymore. Um, everybody got a certificate of completion, uh, what we call an IFAC, an individual first aid kit. Um, and, you know, they knew how to do something to help others. So um, students came up to us to thank us pretty much every day, all the time. Um, one of them, you know, because it concentrates on that first hour post-injury, one of the students comes up and says, you know, the purpose of ATLS, it's in the Talmud. He says, whoever saves one life saves the world entire. I knew I had heard that phrase recently in a different setting, and it took me a while to remember. And then I remembered where I had heard it, and some of you may remember this as well. You know I love movies. Um, you'll see more. Um, one other just sort of a interesting branch off the tree. When I arrived on my first trip, I became engaged in a small side hustle, which I didn't anticipate. And it kind of goes directly back to my friend Malcolm Nance and the Commonwealth Club, which also is no coincidence that I wound up going to Ukraine after having been out with him. Uh, this is him with his game face. He is now in the Northeast in Ukraine, in the International Legion, he had gone back to fight the war. 
And, and what did I hear from him? He says, we need IV insertion needles, infusion tubing, and resuscitation fluid. A major offensive is coming. My medics are out of stuff. And I'm like, seriously, man. Uh, he says, we need to be able to stabilize our wounded. I'm getting this on an encrypted chat group. And I'm thinking, okay, I'll figure this out. We'll do it. Um, my interpreters helped me a lot. I scoured pharmacies in Kiev, uh, went to some medical supply places, texted when I had it all. And he says, there will be a courier in front of your hotel in an hour uh, and to pick up the stuff because we really need it. So I have a fully loaded Uber here. The back seat's loaded. The back trunk is loaded with all this stuff. Uh, and a courier shows up. He drives up in a van. He opens the rear doors. Uh, we, in in the, his van are you know, anti-tank weapons and grenades and drones. And I add my medical supplies from here. And he says, you know, when I get there, uh, we'll let you know that the stuff is delivered. And, uh, you know, that was great. So the next day I get a post uh, on an encrypted website that shows the medics taking the gear out of the boxes and putting them in their first aid kits. And, uh, you know, my friends were forever so grateful. And, and I was glad I could help, but the little I could do. Um, so I went there and I taught. Um, you know, I'm a teacher, and but I also learned a lot. And I have to share some of those lessons with you. One of which is the Ukrainians are a highly educated people. They are extremely tech savvy and entrepreneurial. The younger generation has adopted English. They're looking West. They have no interest in being part of Russia. They carry on a normal life as best they can in the face of adversity, knowing there's a war, might have to run to the bomb shelters, might have to put on a uniform and go fight. They're very, very patriotic. I'll show you some examples. Um, they have a lot of expressions of patriotism and solidarity when you walk around. This is in Kiev. Uh, this, this is a, a, a mural on the wall of a building, Stand with Ukraine, uh, tells you how to donate some money to this particular um, charity for Ukrainian support. And, and it's uh, got the picture of Ukrainian saint on there. One, one of my favorites is a saint uh, on the side of a building uh, who holds a, a, an anti-tank weapon. And down in the corner, there's a QR code if you want to donate for them to help buy stuff to defend Ukraine militarily, which is pretty interesting. And, uh, you know, the Ukrainians are taking the fight to the east and south to get rid of the Russians. And it, it's not working real well right now. And of course, now it's it's tough time because weather's come in and, you know, it's raining, it's snowing. Uh, they've got all the minefields and stuff. This is a tough fight. The Russians had years in some of these areas to prepare. Remember, they took some of these areas in 2014. They had nine or 10 years. When you look at a satellite photo, uh, you see the lines across here. This is in Zaporizhia Oblast. Uh, here's the line across with an anti-tank ditch. Here's something called Devil's Teeth. And here's a defensive trench. I'll show you what this looks like with a, a little satellite imagery. Since the start of the invasion, Russia has been digging along the 900-mile front line and even on its own territory. The first layer of defense shown in many satellite images is the anti-tank ditch. The obstacle is meant to be too wide for a tank to cross, restricting an enemy's ability to maneuver and funnel their forces into areas that make them more vulnerable to attack. Next are rows of concrete blocks called Dragon's Teeth. They form a barrier that makes it difficult for heavy vehicles to pass through. And the third line is a trench. This is the most common type of defensive work and the easiest to construct. Russian forces dug many trenches along roads, junctions and bridges, and even on the beaches of Crimea. And Ukrainian forces are likely to face further traps. I believe landmines have also been hidden between defensive lines. So... This was obviously going to be a very difficult slog to kick the Russians out of, of that last bastion they have in eastern Ukraine. They had a long time to prepare. Uh, nobody was quite prepared for how many mines and things they were. Um, and they've been strewn everywhere without maps, which is really crazy. Sometimes the Russians, you know, are taken out by their own stuff. But part of the problem is, you know, we're trying to uh, handle this very slow and difficult fight. And the Ukrainians were missing something, as we'll talk about. The Russians were well dug in. They have a much greater industrial capacity. They have four times the population. They keep recruiting. Uh, they're going to have another, apparently, another 
call up another conscription of another half a million men. Uh, they have air superiority. And this is very important in this fight. Uh, those of us who, who have some experience in, in sitting at the table when they're doing war plans, you've got to have uh, air, aircraft, as we'll talk about. Why do I worry? Well, you know, if Putin's successful, um, the next stop, we talked about Kaliningrad on this map, the that red spot there. Um, you know, he's going to have to open a direct road and railroad from Russia through Belarus into Kaliningrad. That means going through Lithuania. Uh, there's a good chance that they might want to take on Moldova, like where I put this arrow down here. And I'm very, very worried, as are most planners, about this area up here where the Baltic states are. So Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia at great risk. Moldova, where there's already Russian troops who have been in Transnistria for 20 years, places we never even heard of years ago. But, you know, they're all they're all at high risk. So um, the bear is hungry. But I want to pull back and change gears because... There's another branch off this tree that some of us feel that the Hamas attack on Israel actually fits into this scenario, into this story. And, and I'm going to give you kind of some speculation, uh, educated speculation. We know that on October 7th, the Hamas terrorists from Gaza Strip launched a, a, an attack. They killed approximately 1,200 Israelis, mostly civilians. They took hostages. There's horrible scenes of torture and beheading. Um, I mean, it's it's a horrible, horrible thing. It's a stain on Netanyahu and his government and the military and their intelligence. They dropped the ball. But given that, um, the Israeli government and the military, they awaken. Uh, individuals fight back. Some family members are rescued. There's a great story of the general who was retired, who grabbed his pistol, and he and his wife drove south, and they rallied troops. And he actually went and rescued his kids and grandkids uh, who were in a safe room. Uh, they drove the terrorists out or killed them. Um, the military called up reserves and they had embarked on an attack on Gaza, which is a whole other subject we won't have time to today. But what I want to talk about is what do intelligence guys and analysts and planners feel about a Russian connection to the Hamas terrorist attacks on Israel? This is really important. Think about a couple things. Who benefited by that terrorist attack? Who really benefited? Is Hamas benefiting? No, they're getting they're getting hammered. Uh, they're gonna they might be destroyed. Who knows? Are the Palestinian people winning something from this conflict? Yeah, they get some attention, but it, it's a pretty terrible price. Uh, I think the coalition of Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran uh, launched an assault on democracy using their proxies. Uh, you know, by using their proxies, they can pretend they didn't do it. Uh, three countries you know, are really hammering Ukraine. We know North Korea is supplying Russia with artillery rounds. We know Iran is supplying them with drones and short and medium range missiles. So they're really invested in getting rid of this little democracy. And China's done some stuff, not only supplying the Russians uh, surreptitiously uh, to some extent, but also they've done things like drag anchors across communications, cables, and pipelines in the North Sea to disrupt NATO countries. So, um, you know, I, I think all these four countries are in on it and probably knew this was coming. Certainly, Iran was supplying money and weapons to Hamas. Russia probably was too. Um, you know, so who really benefits? Who really has gotten something out of the Palestine conflict? Because what I see on television news every day, everyone's losing. The Israelis are losing. The Palestinians are losing. Um, it's terrible. Uh, Russia and Iran, they win big time. They've divided the United States and NATO allies. They've divided our capabilities. They've divided our intelligence assets. We're now trying to, uh, they're also reducing our flow of weapons and aid to Ukraine because, you know, we're going to have to send some to Israel. We don't have enough to send to Ukraine. Uh, and like I said, we're now trying to follow two conflicts and keep an eye on them with our satellites and our imagery and our intelligence analysts. So they've divided our skills and made us partly take our eye off the ball in Ukraine, which is bad. Uh, and they weaken the West by taking Ukraine war off the news media. You don't hardly see anything on the news for two months now, which is bad. Um, they sunk the Israeli Saudi Arabian rapprochement. You know, they almost had diplomatic relations. They were on the verge of signing a, a, a coda to the Abraham Accords. They're going to have diplomatic relations and travel between their countries. Um, and of course, this is tremendously divided the citizens of Western nations who are choosing up 
you know, to demonstrate for one side or the other and fighting perhaps. It's it's very divisive in our country. So whose fingerprints are on it? Well, for sure, the Iranians. Um, who benefits from all this? Uh, not just the Iranians. Um, right after this happened, Putin hosted the Iranian foreign minister and he welcomed Hamas leadership to Russia. So, you know, he's condemned over it, whatever that means. And people say this should cause concern. Yeah, it should cause concern. You know, he helped start a war. He, the Iranians and Hamas attacked Israel. It's a democracy. These guys don't want thriving democracies. So uh, I think their fingerprints are all over it. The Russians, the Iranians um, are in on it with the North Koreans and maybe the Chinese. <clears throat> Ukraine is in trouble. Excuse me, I believe they do have a good future. I am optimistic, despite the state of our Congress and its inability to pass any legislation, I believe that Ukraine will survive and thrive. The crisis created a very solid Ukrainian national identity. More, never been like this. It mobilized Ukrainians in new ways to defend their country. I think they'll continue to develop as a democracy and a market economy, and they're getting control over issues. Uh, it used to be what we used to joke that it was a bribery economy like the Soviet Union where you couldn't get anything done uh, without passing a bribe. But of course, as we've seen in our own Senate and Congress, and maybe our Supreme Court, there's some of that here. Uh, they're doing better. Their Supreme Court uh, justice, the chief of their courts in, in prison right now for accepting a bribe. Uh, a lot of their military recruiters went to jail for accepting bribes. So they're very much going west. They, they want to do this. So what's the future hold? Well, I think the Ukrainian military will persevere and make gains as long as we are in their corner and continue to supply them. And I want to talk more about that when we get time. It's not time to negotiate. Uh, the Russians will bargain aggressively when they start to lose because they want to hold on to everything they can hold on to. Um, a couple of you in the audience are, are doctors and those of us who are surgeons. Uh, you may remember we had Russian forceps and years ago I asked my professor, why are they called Russian forceps? He says, well, you know, when they grab onto something, they don't let go. And, uh, you know, I still use that as a, a joke in this, but it's the Russians don't let go, but they're going to have to return all the occupied lands because it, it violates international law. Where's the United Nations? I realize the Russians have a veto on the Security Council, but where where's their cojones? You know, I don't know. Um, should they give back Crimea? Probably. Um, stuff we all got to talk about. It's complicated. I don't have simple answers. Um, there is a future for Ukraine. Um, I think the success of Ukrainian democracy undermines Putin. People will see freedom and prosperity in Ukraine. Uh, which I remember from past times as an example, they're going to want that. Uh, it could be a shining light like West Germany used to be in contrast to the dark gray of East Germany. I remember as one of those backpacking students after college uh, taking the uh, subway in Berlin from West Berlin to East Berlin, and you went from basically a neon thriving upscale uh, country with food on the shelves and goods in the stores to uh, East Germany, where there was no food on the shelves and very little in the stores. And it was gray. It was like a black and white movie. Uh, that dark gray of East Germany brought down the Berlin Wall and it brought down the Soviet Union ultimately. So people want that. Uh, and we saw that wall come down in 1989. It seems like it was just yesterday, doesn't it? Um, I think we need to give the Ukrainians everything they need for this fight. Give their forces stuff. We've got to ignore Russian blackmail and their threats of nuclear war. Can't can't play the game that way. So they've been given attack arms, which are long range, long range missiles. They need more. They need more cruise missiles like the Storm Shadow and the Scalp. We just delivered the first 31 Abrams tanks, and, and we've done a lot of Bradley armored vehicles. Uh, and we'll talk a little more about that. We should have done it sooner and faster. Uh, and they need F-16 aircraft and helicopters. They have to regain control of their own air. It's very important. So Rishi Shunak said, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. I say this to our allies. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini. Pretty bold. Yes, we need to give them everything. And the thing we need to have given them a year ago is air power. 
uh, it will allow Ukraine to push the Russian aircraft back. So right now, the Russian aircraft come right up to the border and launch their missiles and glide bombs in, into Ukraine, do a lot of damage, mostly to hospitals and schools, as you saw. Uh, push them back. Um, you know, they're going to come and bomb the electric grid and the heat and power plants this winter when it's snowing. And that's, you know, pretty terrible. Uh, they've got to have air power. Uh, the reason that ground offensive didn't work very well recently, they didn't have any air power. You can't do combined arm. I mean, I'm a medical guy, and I know that you can't do combined arms operations without air power. You've got to have some control of the air. Um, so, you know, the county counteroffensive was very costly, and the next one will be too if they don't have air power. You got to have advanced aircraft. What do they need? Well, you know, the Russians are threatening this and threatening that, but you got to have air power. They need F-16s. They needed them yesterday. To learn how to fly one, the pilots need English proficiency. Um, Ukraine has sent eight English proficient pilots for training. That's not exactly a fighter squadron or two. Um, but, you know, I want to take you back in history now that I'm an amateur historian. All the stuff I've read all these years comes. Uh, I want us to resurrect the Flying Tigers model from World War II. Uh, some of you may remember that. So the Flying Tigers, um, General Claire Chenault, you know, resigned his commission and a lot of his pilots resigned their commission. And they went and they fought uh, as mercenaries against the Japanese in Burma um, to get a, a handle not only on fighting the Japanese in the air, but also to help defend uh, the nationalist Chinese. So over the years, there's been 3,000 F-16s produced and sold around to, by Lockheed to our allies. They're now being retired in favor of the newer advanced things like the F-35. There's thousands of trained pilots in numerous countries, not only NATO countries like Denmark uh, and you know Norway, but in Pakistan, other countries who bought them. Many of these guys would go fight for democracy in a heartbeat. Uh, or they might just fight as mercenaries, you know, if we want to do the flying tiger model completely. But I bet we could get uh, lots of pilots to go with these planes because, you know, a couple of the NATO countries have already donated their planes, but we don't have guys to fly them. I think we should stand up an international volunteer squadron, just like we did with the International Legion that my friend Malcolm Nance is in. And, and we ought to go out and recruit the pilots who already know how to fly these, and, you know, could get a quick refresher and put them in the battle. It's an awesome tool. It is for a plane that's being phased out. It's pretty impressive. I'm going to give you a little taste. F-16 fighter jet, the sky's ultimate predator. <laughs> Currently, there are approximately 3,000 F-16s in active service across 25 countries. One of the key advantages of the F-16 is its speed and agility, making it a formidable fighter in air-to-air -air combat situations. So... I want to go on because we're getting close to the end of the hour and I want to have time for questions. Um, you know, every generation has its examples of valor. Um, my generation, I grew up with this one, the Marines raising the American flag on Mount Suribachi on Iwo Jima. Um, history has said at one time that this was five Marines and one Navy medical corpsman. Uh, now there's some history that says maybe it was six Marines. It's a controversy that I like to tweak the Marines with. But, but now... There's this guy named Vladimir Zelensky, an actor who became president, and he's standing up to a dictator. He was offered a ride out of Kiev during when the war started, and he said, you know, what did he become? He became a steadfast icon. I don't need a ride out of Kiev. I need more ammunition. We're going to fight the Russians. Uh, he's here, you know, to ask for aid, and I'm very disappointed our Congress has let him down. Um, he's really this generation's Winston Churchill. Uh, I'm old enough to have heard a lot of Winston Churchill speeches uh, back in the day and, and in my history classes. I'm going to give you a taste of one because he's so good. Never give in. Never give in. Never, never, never. In nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. Pretty impressive speech, and I suspect that, uh, you know, Vladimir Zelensky is, is very tuned into it. Um, he'll never give in. So sometimes I get a little depressed. The world's really messed up. Um, how do I remain optimistic, especially this week with what's going on in Israel and Gaza? 
Well, the Ukrainian kids are amazing. If you've seen me talk about this before, I got to talk about it again. Uh, we already saw an example of a 15-year-old drone pilot uh, who went to war with his drone. Um, but we get students from a middle school who are 13 to 15 years old. And what do they tell us during these interviews? Generation In English. who uh, has to uh, promote it to develop our country after the war. Soldiers now are fighting in the south and east of Ukraine. And we have to fight here. We have to develop our skills. We have to make a future and the history for our country. It's something that's happening right now. It's a real crime, a real genocide, and you cannot forget about it. People need to remember, people have to care. And it's not something that only affects Ukrainians. It's something that will sooner or later affect the whole world. If you don't help us now, you'll be the next. You'll be the next who will be in the war with this evil who has arisen from the ashes of your indecision. So decide now, or you just, you will need to fight with this on your own land. These kids are impressive. Um, and, you know, 13 to 15 years old, uh, fighting with drones, speaking, uh, giving an interview in English, not their native language. I mean, they're very impressive. Not every kid is like that, but, you know, they, they inspire me quite a bit. The other person who inspires me a lot is Professor Timothy Snyder, a Yale historian who knows several, you know, speaks several languages in that part of the world, uh, has written several books. Bloodlands is a great read if you can get through it about all the trauma that has gone back and forth across Ukraine. Uh, basically, everybody fighting for that agricultural farmland. And he also wrote a book before that called The Road to Unfreedom. So he knows a lot about uh, democracy and autocracy and the difference. Um, so interestingly enough, he says, I'm going to quote him, the war will not end because of a sudden event, nor will it go on indefinitely. When and how it ends depends largely on us, on what we do, on how much we help. Ending the war with the Ukrainian victory would be by far the best thing Americans could do for themselves. And I'll explain to you why. Uh, in the history of power dynamics, there's never been a chance to secure so much for American security with so little effort by Americans. So we have people fighting the Russians, basically using NATO and uh, American equipment and weapons and grinding down the Russian army so that we don't have to fight them. Because as I said, if they took Ukraine, we'd be fighting them in Kaliningrad and in Moldova and other places. So he also said the war will not end because of a sudden event, nor will it go on indefinitely. When and how it ends is going to depend largely on us, on what we do, on how much we help. Uh, Ending the war with the Ukrainian victory would be the best thing Americans could do for themselves. So, you know, we're, we're not doing much, giving them some money, 5% of our defense budget, and I'll come back to that in a bit. Um, he says, we must be prepared for courageous acts. If we are passive rather than acting with courage, we'll be easy targets. And so my last movie that I want to share with you, my favorite of all. Here it is. Welcome back to the fight. This time I know our side will win. So I think all of us have to be in this fight. We have to give Ukraine our support. Um, they're fighting this. Uh, they're fighting it with stuff that we're sending them from basically our war stocks. This couldn't be a better boon for the U.S. economy, by the way. You know, 75% of the money that Congress had deployed to Ukraine uh, ultimately went to uh, U.S. companies because we're sending them our old gear and we're making new stuff. And we are putting people to work and we're mostly putting them to work in, um, you know, defense industries, a lot of them in red states, interestingly. We all need to be in this fight. I'm going to end on the Slava Ukraini and I'm going to ask those of you who have questions to put them in the chat room or perhaps to raise your hand, if you would, and uh, uh, I'll try and you know, call on you as, as we can, and Shana can keep an eye on the screen for me if somebody does raise their hand. Um, but I want to thank you all for spending this hour with me. Uh, got to know some history, got to know some geography, got to know some of the politics, got to understand some of the military things like why you need air power, why they needed it a year ago. Uh, this is going to be a tough fight, and I think we need to support Ukraine. Supporting democracy is very important. Um, all right, so any questions? Uh, I don't see a lot, but uh, and I, I don't see a hand up. So let's see. Well, Sandy, thank you for your...
compliment. Ask me a hard question. Um, what are we going to do with Congress? Uh, I have I have no no clue. Thanks, Gordy. Um, you know, Congress. Every time I hear the current Speaker of the House speak, it makes me want to swear like a sailor. Um, and and I try to avoid that, especially in public or when it's being recorded. Uh, I, I sometimes I wonder what country I'm in. When it gets me really depressed, uh, I sometimes hark back to uh, Rachel Maddow did an incredibly good podcast years ago uh, called Ultra. And it talks about the late 1930s and early 1940s when we had a large number of congressmen and senators who were pro-Nazi and were using their um, stuff to, including their franking privileges, to send out Nazi propaganda. Uh, if you ever can see her uh, website, Ultra, I, I mean, her podcast, Ultra, it, it's it's very, very interesting, and I, I highly, highly recommend it. In any event, um, can I comment on the Minsk Accords and how they fit in? Well, you know, that's an interesting question, and I'm kind of glad you asked that in a way. It's a, a little beyond me in the terms of how things had developed, but let's go over a, a couple of points in diplomacy and negotiations between Ukraine and the Soviet Union. And when the Soviet Union fell apart in 1991, uh, in 1994, the U.S. helped broker a deal where Ukraine gave their nuclear weapons and stuff to Russia itself in exchange for a guarantee for their borders and their sovereignty. Um, but we saw how that went. So here we are. Uh, Russia signed on to it to guarantee their sovereignty and their borders. And in 2014, they decided to unsign and invade. Now, I like to think that we're the guys with the white hats and we're the good guys, but we signed on to the JCPOA, you know, the Iran nuclear deal. And the last president walked away, um, you know, and just said, no, nah, we're not going to do that. So, you know, interesting. Um we have some things that we could make up for in, in our, uh, um, you know, um, our own history. Uh, we need to do better. But I think it, it's really important to uh, get behind Ukraine and get behind our Congress. Uh, so Congress needs to see this. Well, chances are they won't. Uh, but you know what? Every morning, you know, while I'm having my coffee, I, I send out a couple of texts or emails to various congressmen. Uh, who aren't doing the right thing. I don't have to send it to, to somebody like Eric Swalwell or one of the guys in, in my part of California because they already get this. Uh, but I, I send it out to the guys in states that, that don't realize that there's groups of us, particularly who are veterans, who are very supportive of Ukraine. I belong to a group called Vote Vets. One of the board members is a guy named Alexander Venman, former lieutenant colonel. You may remember him from Trump and his first impeachment. Um, you know, a lot of us in these veterans groups, very supportive of Ukraine. And so we tell those congressmen and senators to get off their, you know what, and, and get in the fight. So, you know, if you get a chance to a couple emails into their websites and say we should be all out supporting Ukraine, great question. Uh, Elizabeth asks about volunteering, donating. Uh, I would say there's a number of really good places to donate. Uh, Ukraine 24 is, I believe, the foundation set up by Zelensky's wife um, to help support things in Ukraine. Uh, the Ukraine Freedom Foundation is one that was established here in Northern California uh, by some guys who the first week of the war went to Ukraine because they wanted to see for themselves what's going on. And, and I don't mean young guys. I mean, my age peers, retired guys went and said, you know, I, I got to see what this is. Um, very, very important question. Um, one of my favorite uh, donations these days and has been for the last decade um, is World Central Kitchen. I, I think Chef Andres needs a Nobel Prize, uh, not just in Ukraine. Uh, I saw the World Food Kitchen when I was there during the height of the combat around uh, after Kiev was liberated completely. Um, very impressive to see them. Guy needs a Nobel Prize. Uh, I, I'll, I'm sure they're working lots of other places. Um, how do we start a conversation, Lorraine asks, about... Uh, uh, this in the media. Um, like I said, I, I think your emails and your texts have an impact. It's small, but you know what? I, I know how they do this stuff in Congress, so they don't exactly read them. They, they go for the subject. And, uh, you know, what they do is is uh, they, they want 
if they get a hundred or a thousand on a certain subject leaning a certain way, then they take action. So I think that's important. Um, great question. I think you just need to press, uh, send out a couple emails every morning. I was in the Baltics a, a couple uh, years ago, a year ago, according to Carolyn, and was told that Ukraine is fighting for all of us. No kidding. Uh, and, and we're fighting the Russians without spending American lives. And we're not spending much of our defense budget. Uh, and that's the other thing. Just remember, 75% of all that money they vote for Ukraine goes into American industries, to American jobs. Uh, very little of it is cash to Ukraine, less than 25%. So, um, yeah, and you're concerned about Congress? Uh, yeah, uh, we've been here before, which doesn't exactly give me heart, but, you know, we've been here before. Congress can have its head you know where. Um, you know, I also lecture about stuff that the American government's done wrong. So uh, thank you. And, and thank you, Cherie, for your comments and Gina. Um, I see, you know, generally speaking, I just want us to all stick with Ukraine. You can't be bored. These aren't sound bites. These are kids who maybe have lost their homes, maybe their parents in uniform, maybe they've lost a parent. Um, you know, Ukraine is going to need help for 30 years to get out of this. Uh, you know, it's like looking at those documentaries after World War II. We're going to need a Marshall Plan for Ukraine. Um, at the same time, we've got other conflicts going on in other areas where we need to be attentive to what's going on. I think the best way to be attentive is to be informed, to have discussion with your neighbors, um, and to share what you know with others. So again, I want to thank you all for joining me today. And, and I'll end on Slava Ukraini, and I'll talk. Uh, turn the screen back to Shana. Thank you again for your help, Shana, today. Thank you, Dr. Baker, so much. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we hope that you enjoyed the presentation. So as you noticed, it is recorded, um, and it will be posted on our YouTube page um, very soon. And um, so you can share with your friends and family that way. And um, thank you so much again, Dr. Baker. We really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you for your help. All right. Um, everyone, and I will just post once again, the, um, if you want to learn more about becoming an OLLI member, you can click this link in the chat, um, and then one of our membership team will contact you. Thank you. Have a great day.